we're going to be studying Matthew 8 today, but overall I think that the picture of Matthew 8 is just this beautiful reminder that Jesus heals, that Jesus saves, and that is the central message of Matthew 8. He heals us spiritually. He heals us physically. He has the power over life and death. He has the power over anything that might be oppressing us, both externally and internally. He has the power over fear. And it is such an incredible message. So I actually can't wait to read the scripture today. Um, though I did sit there and struggle with it, it's just so clear. Sometimes God speaks to us so very simply. Hey, remember that I am healer. So let's pray today and then we'll get started. Jesus, we thank you so much that you speak to us plainly. We thank you so much that for those who have ears to hear, that you speak. God, we lift up all of those to you who right now are feeling stress or anxiety or fear. God, may you remind them that you are healer, that you are savior, that you are willing and that you are good. We praise you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's jump into it. Matthew 8 it says, When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So again, this is right after he has been up on the mountain giving um, the sermon, you know, what we talked about in chapters 5, 6, and 7. So he's coming down from that and immediately large large crowds are following him wanting kind of a piece of him right and this man who is probably likely a Jewish man but he comes up to him and he has leprosy um, and the Bible says it could have been any kind of skin disease but they're calling them all leprosy but the point is that he was a man who was deemed to be unclean right and the mere fact of touching him or associated associating with him would have also made somebody unclean and so it says that this man approached him and he kneels before him some versions of the bible say that he worshiped before him and he calls him lord and the greek word here is kurios um, and that actually means it's like a hebrew name for yahweh right so he's acknowledging that this man in front of him this person that they call teacher is actually lord and he says if you are willing then you can make me clean Right? And so verse 3, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So this is a big deal because Jesus is showing in this movement that yes, he heals, but that he also heals with compassion. He touched him right? This is a man that likely for, we don't know how long he was sick for, but as long as he was sick, he hadn't felt a human touch, right? And Jesus here is restoring that. And he's also kind of making this point that because Jesus, he himself is so clean that when he touches something that's unclean, he himself won't get muddy. He himself won't be unclean. Instead, what happens is that his clean, cleanliness transfers over to the person that he's touching. And he is willing to heal here and he tells the man to be clean and then he gives him this kind of strange um, point to say like hey make sure that you don't tell anyone on your way to go um, to uh, to the other priest right and so the reason that he's going to the priest is to prove that a miracle happened right so that they could see and they could be like yes this, this did in fact happen um, and so he does not want him to stop along the way and tell people what happened now why there could be lots of reasons why we're not quite sure one of them could be that he didn't want the crowds even more crowds to start forming right and that his time just hadn't come yet for that public acknowledgement of all the works that he was going to be doing um, another could be that he didn't want anybody to um, not qualify that particular act as a miracle right so if he ran into someone first maybe they would say something else cured him or someone else cured him but by going directly to the temple not stopping at all um, and getting this word from the priest that it would actually point back to just Jesus and Jesus was the one who healed him um, so the point here though is that we see that Jesus heals and he touch he heals somebody here with a touch now we move on to the story of the face of the centurion and it says in verse 5 when jesus had entered capernaum the centurion came to him asking for help 
Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering, suffering terribly. So this is a big deal because a centurion would have been, you know, working for Rome. He would have been a Roman soldier, not someone who necessarily would have been easily following Jesus. The Romans were in many ways persecuting or uh, at least didn't see them as on par with them, right, by any means. But this person who has a bit of authority is coming in and, and saying, he's calling Jesus Lord and he's acknowledging that. And so he tells him about a servant of his that is at home paralyzed. And I kind of love the fact, and it kind of shows you the character and the heart of the centurion, that he's not asking for healing for himself or even maybe a family member, but a servant, right? Um, Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? So it's kind of a little bit of a, a, a question that's egging him on it, but he wants to see how the centurion is going to respond. And the centurion replies, verse 8, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And, verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places to the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subject of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there are only there's only one other time where Jesus is amazed that we see in the scripture. This, this is one of the times, right? And it's because of this faith that this centurion has. Um, the other time is actually in Mark chapter 6, verses 6, when he's talking about he being amazed at the lack of faith that Jews have. So both the times that God is amazed, it has to do with faith or lack of faith, right? Um, but here, this is really interesting because the centurion is humbling himself and he's understanding that although he carries a bit of authority, and he's not saying this to be like self-important or arrogant or anything like this, he's acknowledging like, hey, even me with the little bit of authority I have with these hundred of men that are serving me, I have the power to tell one of them to go do something and it'll be done. So you, Lord, right, kind of commander, and he's kind of saying like, he's recognizing that he is under Jesus, how much more can he then tell somebody, pass along a message, and it will heal them and it will encourage them? And so this is what amazes Jesus. And Jesus makes it a point to do a couple things. One, in verse 13, he says, Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done as you would believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. So he acknowledges the centurion's faith, and then he imparts the healing, and he doesn't even have to be in the place with the person. So he does those things, but he also makes this distinction and says, make sure to bring in the Gentile world, right? Um, and he, he says to them, I say to you, many will come from the east and the west, will take their place with the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So there's going to be people that essentially the Jews wouldn't have been expected to be invited into the kingdom of heaven that are going to be there. And then there are going to be people who feel like they deserve, that they're entitled to be there because there's a, they're a direct connection to the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who will not, in fact, be there. And so he does a few things at once um, with kind of one or two sentences there. So let's look at verse 14, Jesus heals many. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. So here's just one interesting thing. We realize that Peter is married here, right? If he's at his mother-in-law's house, Peter's married. Um, and so Jesus goes in verse 15, he touches her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. So here we see uh, Jesus having compassion again. He's, he's visiting his disciples, his friend's house and sees that his mom is sick and rather than just kind of ignore her, he chooses to put a hand on her and to heal her and she is well immediately. He heals immediately, right? And she gets up and she goes to serve him immediately, right? So she's healed and she goes to serve. Verse 16, when evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all of the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. And so 
And we see here that Matthew is weaving in the Old Testament, something again that would have been very familiar to the Jewish ears and hearing that and, and recognizing he's, he's saying Isaiah is a prophetic book, right? And so he's saying, hey, remember that thing that you read in Isaiah? Remember that thing that you've memorized that you have in your soul? It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is fulfilling these prophecies that you're waiting on, right? Um, and so what he's doing here is that all these people are coming, right? As if you if you would hear here that there's this incredible healer, um, they're bringing all their demon possessed, and with one word, he casts those demons out and he heals their sick. So after this, we see the cost of following Jesus, and we're seeing two stories that are juxtaposed here. Um, so in verse 18, it says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. So he sees this whole crowd again, and he's taking a distance, right? He's taking a step. Um, and then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. So a teacher of the law, right? Another for another rabbi, someone who knows the, the, the law is coming to him and says, and says, Hey, I want to follow you wherever you go. And so he is uh, excited. He is encouraged. He is ready, right? But Jesus must sense something about this guy's heart or maybe his motives, and we're not sure, but his answer, his response to him in verse 20 is Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And so he's saying like, hey, I know you're saying that you want to follow me, but have you really thought about what it's going to cost you? We're not going to be going and staying in beautiful palaces and beautiful places and rest like the son of man actually has no such place, right? So if you're saying you're going to follow me, what you're following is a life that's going to be wandering, right? And so he says that and it's almost a wonder if it's a test to see like, what is it that you really want here? Why do you really want to follow me here? The next verse, um, another disciple says to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father, right? So the disciple is saying, he's realizing that it's time, Jesus is time, it's time to go, it's time to move on. But this disciple who's been with him, sitting with him, listening to him, all of a sudden remembers that he has this gigantic task to do of burying his father. In that time period, um, although the burial would happen right away, the, the events that would take place after um, you know, a, a death, the mourning would take over well over a year, or would happen throughout a year. Right, um, and then if, if he was the eldest son, which we don't know the text doesn't say, but if he was, he was to be expected to go back as the eldest son and take the bones from the original burial place into a different one. Right, so essentially, what this guy is saying is like, Hey, I've got some stuff to take care of first, and then can I take care of that? And then when that's done, can I come back and join you? And Jesus' response seems kind of like harsh um but again remember that jesus knows our intention he knows our heart and so he responds in verse 22 jesus told him follow me and let the dead bury their own dead and some version says let the spiritually dead bury their own dead right and so again we have to understand that he knows who he's talking to and so he's likely answering something very specific in this guy's heart and I think what we can take of it is is this this is the cost of following Jesus. There are things and there are times that we are going to make sacrifices, right? Um, and he's saying this this walk with me. If you choose to come follow me, it's not all going to be about glitz and glamour and having your every wish and need met, right? It's going to cost you something, um, and the time is now, right? The time to follow him is now, not when you've got all your stuff together, not when you've taken care and put all your ducks in a row. The time is now. So after this um, kind of exchange, we hear about Jesus calming the storm. So verse 23, then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And so this is a likely kind of scenario, right? Like if you were on a boat, I don't know if you've ever been on a boat before, but I've been on like a cruise and there's a really bad storm and I'm like kind of looking around, like making sure is everybody else worried? And if everybody else is not worried, I tend to relax and calm down. But if I see other people in a panic, oh, my panic starts to pick up as well. So I'm sure that that's kind of the feeling that the disciples were sitting in, right? They're watching each other. They're realizing everybody is getting panicked and worried here. And so they actually do the right thing, even though Jesus kind of is responding to them in what seems to us uh, kind of like a chastisement, right? But they go and they run to the Lord. 
However, the heart, they don't go and run to him specifically because they believe at this point that he has the power to do anything, but he, they go to him because they don't know where else to go, right? So Jesus replies, um, verse 26, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So here we're seeing their maybe their first realization that Jesus is God, that he is creator of the winds and the earth. And so therefore he has authority over, over the wind and, um, and the earth, right? The wind and the waves. He has authority over the wind and the waves. So after this, we see that Jesus restores two demon-possessed men. And I know that this account, this, this uh, particular story, is in a couple of the other Gospels as well. And there are little differences, but the, the whole of it kind of stays intact and in place. But verse 28, when he arrived at the other side of the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. So can you imagine this? Can you, you finally get where you're going and you're hoping for some rest maybe and relaxation and instead you get two demon possessed men, right? And they were so violent that no one could pass that way. Verse 29, what do you want with us, son of God? They shouted, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? So this is interesting. One, these demons recognize that this is Jesus. This is God. This is who's going to have final authority and judgment over them, right? So they're recognizing it, even though the disciples have yet not fully recognized the magnitude of who they have in front of them. And Jesus shows authority here again. He's not afraid, right? All of these other people are afraid of coming into their space because of how violent they are, but Jesus isn't. So verse 30, some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us to the herd of pigs. 32, he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. So those, uh, 33, those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all of this, including what had happened to the demon possessed men. So these two men are possessed, right? They're, they're demon possessed. They are kind of wreaking havoc in this particular area. Um, they're violent, they're scary. And these demons, when Jesus approaches them immediately, they recognize him and they ask him for something. They ask, don't, before you cast us out, if you're going to cast us out, right? If you're going to take us out, at least put us into those pigs, right? Now, we're not sure why exactly they're asking to be put in the pigs. And we're also not fully under, like, understanding why Jesus then does put them into the pigs. And I think that that's not necessarily the point. Um, at least in the commentaries that I was reading when I was studying this. But it is to show that Jesus has power over these spirits, right? And he has the ability to take them out. And so the people's response to this, verse 34, is then the whole town went to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. So they're scared, right? And we, we know from uh, Mark, um, which also tells the story, that they had lost basically their livelihood, right? These pigs were income for them. And this was a Gentile town um, and they don't really understand everything that's going on, um, but they are afraid. And rather than continue to lose economic, you know, an economic gain, uh, they want this man to go out because for them who they don't understand everything spiritually, they're not looking and understanding it at the whole picture. To them, these pigs were worth more than these two men, right? But to Jesus, to Jesus, these men were worth more than the pigs. So while we're still not fully certain, that's just something that I'm picking up on and that I'm reading into this text and I could see happening. But I would love for you to read the text and see what kind of, you know, the Spirit speaks to you in your heart about that. But overall in Matthew, I think the theme is central, which is that Jesus does heal, right? He does heal and he can do it in an instant and he will do it fully and completely and he is willing. That's it for today. We'll continue our study um, next week. If you have questions or comments or even thoughts that are coming up, please feel free to write me a note, comment, like the video, all of that stuff. Until next time, take care.